Well, good morning. Welcome to Faith Community Bible Church. So glad you are here with us this morning to worship the Lord. Let's stand. And I have a call to worship from Psalm 5 to start us off. Directly related to the first song that we're going to be sing, singing about, singing for joy, uh, the joy that God's put in our hearts. And maybe this morning we're coming in here with all sorts of chaos and craziness, um, but what a beautiful time we have to, to sing and hear others sing around us, um, sing for the joy that, that is in Christ that we have. So we're looking forward to doing that this morning. This is verse 11, Psalm 5. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy and spread your protection over them. That those who love your name may exult in you. So this morning, again, we're going to sing, sing with joy. Um, and, and I encourage you, if you're feeling uh, unjoyful this morning, if you're feeling maybe tired, worn down, um, busyness is, is crazy right now, I, I know, for many people. But let's... Let's come together, let's worship the Lord, let's, uh, let's sing to him because he's worthy, right? We get this great opportunity to, uh, to praise his name this morning. So let's do that. coming? All right. We have a great opportunity again to, to praise the Lord. Um, I wasn't planning on sharing this, but I'm going to. Um, 
early 2000s, uh, I was in Mexico with a friend, and um, we were having worship on the beach, and he, he died of a heart attack right behind, uh, right behind us as we were worshiping. And the night before, he said, you know, I'm doing what the Lord wants me to do. I'm praising him. I'm serving him. I'm, I'm worshiping him. And, and um, he, he died the next day. And he even said, if I die, I'm doing what God wants me to do. And so the encouragement this morning is just, um, he came into my head while we were singing that song. It's just the joy that we have in the Lord. And, and this, don't take these moments for granted, coming to worship, uh, coming to to fellowship, to check on other people that are around you, because um, we're all going through a lot. Um, so we're coming today just to to remind ourselves of, of what God has done and to, to celebrate him, because he's worthy of that. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to continue to worship. We're going to hear from Dave later. Just a great a great message, great reminder to share that that news with other people. So let's continue this morning.
Well, good morning, church family. My name is Josiah Gerbitz, and I'm the pastor for Family Ministry at FCBC. And in case you don't know, Family Ministry at FCBC consists of our ministries to disciple children, youth, and parents. And I have the wonderful opportunity to give elder oversight to those areas of ministry. So as many of you know, our youth group had a pastor transition away from FCBC about a year ago due to unexpected health issues in his family. Since then, we've had some great youth volunteers step up to offer some additional support, and we hired an interim youth ministries director named Mackenzie Boudreau. Mackenzie's time at FCBC is coming to an end as he's transitioning to seminary this coming August. So as part of my responsibilities as pastor for family ministry, I've been leading the hiring process for a replacement for Mackenzie. In the process, our elders have decided that we would like to place additional priority on ministry to youth in our church, because there's a lot of them, by not just hiring one youth worker, but hiring two. And so this morning, I have our candidates for the full-time permanent youth director positions here to introduce themselves to you. Our directors function under the oversight of the elders, and they serve to implement the vision of the elders in a specific area of ministry at FCBC. These two men have a heart for youth, and they align closely with the vision of our elders for youth ministry at FCBC. Charles Cano, the candidate for the high school director position, will be coming up to introduce himself first. And then after he introduces himself, Ben Kreckman, the candidate for the junior high director position, will introduce himself and then pray before kids are dismissed. So Charles, if you could come up at this time. Good morning, church. How are we doing this morning? Good. Good. Uh, yeah, first off, I just want to give a big thank you. Um, we, my family and I, we got in Tuesday night around midnight, um, and so we've had the last uh, week to just be able to meet uh, different members in the church. Uh, we even were able to attend the youth group on Wednesday, um, and so it's just, we've been received with a, a very warm welcome, and so I just want to thank you guys for that. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, so I'm married to my wife, Becca. We just celebrated five years of marriage on May 6th. We have three children. Uh, our oldest, her name is Hazel. Her birthday was in April. So she's three. Eloise is one and a half. And Caleb is our newest addition. He was born in February. And it's actually his three months today. So, yeah, we, uh, we traveled here from Cleveland, Ohio, where I've been uh, on staff as a pastoral resident at a church called Parkside, uh, where they just spend really a year to, to really train, to develop, equip, and sharpen uh, men for pastoral ministry and then send them out. And so I've been blessed to be there this last year. Uh, and prior to that, we, my family and I, we moved from Spokane, Washington, where I served uh, on staff as a youth pastor for about two years. And then prior to that was just in serving as a lay leader in youth ministry for probably in total about seven or eight years. So youth is a, a big passion for me just in serving in ministry. Uh, I was born and raised in a, in a Christian family attending church, but it was more my later high school years when I started to walk away. And really my, there was no foundation for me, I, although I grew up in church and I, I knew of um, the Bible and, and of Christ and I, I didn't deny him or reject him. But there was just really no firm foundation. I really didn't know what I believed. And so I, I think that played a big part in kind of my wandering in my high school years. And so that is something that has 
led to me wanting to get back and, and serving in, in ministry in any place I can serve God's church. But I do have a heart and a passion for youth ministry to try to disciple, um, teach uh, the, the Bible, to, to hopefully uh, encourage and, and be able to model what it looks like to treasure God's word. Uh, but even more than that, not to just disciple the youth or, or to come in as a replacement, but really to come alongside families, uh, more as a supplement, how to help families uh, disciple in their home. Uh, I know that can be intimidating for some. Uh, maybe if you're a first-generation Christian and, and maybe weren't really discipled, uh, that can be hard, learning how to disciple in your home. And so that's where, as the church, we kind of step in and, and want to come alongside one another. So that's a big uh, passion for me is to, to serve families, to serve with families, to disciple youth. And so, uh, again, I just want to give a big thank you guys for letting me be here this week. I've enjoyed the conversations I've had, and we will be sticking around. So uh, if there's an opportunity to chat a little bit more after service, I would love that. So right now, I'll welcome Ben up. He's going to uh, the candidate for the middle school. Okay, I'm Ben. Uh, I speak with my hands, so I'm walking my elbow. If at any point I wander away from the mic, you guys all have permission to raise your elbow at me, and I'll, I'll adjust, okay? Um, I just got in last night, so I've not gotten to meet any of you guys, and I think it would be fun if I could. So maybe on the count of three, you guys could all say your names, and you can kind of come up to me later, and we'll see how I do, okay? All right, let's do it. One, two, three. Cool. All right, I'm set. Uh, all right, thanks guys. Thank you for letting me be here as well. About me, I, uh, I was saved when I was 17 years old. I grew up in a family that would call itself Christian, but we meant it in the way that someone means they're Italian or they're German. There was a heritage to it, but it didn't have a lot of bearing on our lives. So, so I didn't know the gospel, I uh, didn't know the Lord. But from the ages of 15 to 17, it really just began to... Uh, to weigh on me that I was not the person I needed to be. Um, I always say my favorite superhero was Captain America, right? I had this very uh, lawful good mentality, and I found that I didn't measure up to it. So I was receptive to, to redemption. I wanted redemption. I didn't know if there was any, but I like fantasy stuff. Do you guys, Lord of the Rings? Yeah. All right. Yeah, there we go. Uh, Chronicles of Narnia? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Well, I was reading those kinds of works, I was reading those works, and so I, I bumped into mere Christianity, and I said, I'm going to give this a read and see if there's anything here. And uh, I had to read each chapter two or three times before I really got what he was saying, but the Lord used that to, to save me, to bring me into his kingdom. So from that moment on, he's been pursuing me, and I've been trying to pursue him too. It's led to a lot of cool opportunities, and I'm really grateful for that. I've got to spend some years as a Bible teacher. Uh, some years as a campus evangelist. I'm from a college town in Illinois, so not Chicago, Illinois, more like the cornfields, but it's great. Uh, and so that's been good. I got to spend a couple years as a missions pastor, and we actually, we moved out to the middle of nowhere uh, inside a school building, my wife and I, and we took in a bunch of teenage boys who had just become too disruptive in their own context to stay there. And they lived with us for a year to two years, and, and we just, we taught them really basic things like, hey, this is how you shower. This is how you do your homework on time. Uh, played basketball games with them. I, I did a medieval times event with them, which is one of my highlights. Uh, and then, you know, uh, Bible studies every night, chapel on Sundays, really good conversations about God. And, and that was a blessing. So it's, it's been wonderful. I think that if I had to summarize what compels me to be in ministry, uh, it's 2 Corinthians 5.21, which is, for our sake... He made him to be sin. The Father made the Son to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I just really can't get over the fact that he died for my sins, and uh, it compels me. It keeps pushing me into these situations. And I really have uh, just grown to love doing it in the youth ministry context. I think it's such a cool opportunity to, to address hard questions, to be there for people who are, who are looking for answers, who are just starting to compare their worldview to their parents and assemble their own and, and just be there for them. So, so that's me. Uh, I, I know all of you, obviously, but <laughs> feel free to uh, find me as well after the service, and I'd love to speak with you guys. Uh, we'll pray, and then you guys can greet. The kids can go 
and uh, do their thing as well, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, you are a holy and righteous God. You're a God who, who sees us, who knows us, who cares for us, and Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, uh, I confess that we uh, often act in ways that are, are not pleasing to you, that we often fall short. And uh, Lord, I, I thank you for your son who you sent and who, who paid for sins. And Lord, I thank you that, that we can come to you and that we can come to you now. And Lord, that you're here for us. So Lord, I just ask that you'd help us to use this time for your glory, uh, that, that our minds would be focused on you. Lord, I ask that you would... Uh, Help us to use this greeting time as a chance to get to know each other a little better, to know the people that Christ died for a little more. Uh, and Lord, I ask that you would be with Dave as he, as he preaches as well. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, let's greet each other. All right, well, let's stand as we continue to worship the Lord this morning.
thank you for the hope that we have in your resurrection and in your son Jesus. We pray for Dave as he comes up to bring your word this morning. Be with him and help our hearts and ears and minds to be open to what you have for us. In your name, amen. Friends, I'm very grateful for our worship team who find out, found out two hours before first service that one of their key guys was sick. And so they've been scrambling to figure this out and I'm very grateful for their gift and for their commitment. Thank you. I offered uh, Brian that I could fill in for the man who was sick, and he says, no, thanks, Dave. We'll just, we'll just run with it. We'll be fine. So I did offer. Okay, friends, we are all nearing the end of Ephesians chapter 3, and if you remember the structure of this book, it is first three chapters, the stuff God did for us and the plan he has Second three chapters, the expectations he has for us to respond to all that he did for us. And so a couple weeks ago, we looked at uh, Ephesians 2, 1 to 10, where he talked about here's what God did to overcome our alienation to himself. And then last week, we looked at the, the passage on what did God do to overcome our alienation from each other. And now today, we're going to look at chapter 3, verses 1 to 13. And Paul gets himself sidetracked. Now, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, obviously this is part of the Bible, and uh, it was an intentional, eternal sidetrack, but Paul gets himself sidetracked because uh, he started to say something in verse 1, and then he decided to say a bunch of other stuff, and so next week, uh, back at verse 14, he's going to get back into what he started to say here. Now, it's, it's uh, the Holy Spirit's work, obviously. When I get sidetracked in a sermon, my wife is sitting there just chafing, saying, darling, get, get back on the point. What in the world are we doing out here in the weeds? Paul was not in the weeds. He was right in the middle of what the Spirit uh, wanted him to say. So Ephesians chapter 3, let me read for us, please, starting at verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery. As I wrote before in brief by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, and has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific, here's the mystery, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body, and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power, to me the very least of all the saints. This grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ, and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things, so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. Therefore, I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulation on your behalf, for they are for your glory. Let's pray, please, friends. Lord, thank you for this paragraph that your spirit wrote and that you have preserved uh, for two millennia and that we have in a language we can read. It's a terrific gift to us, Lord. We don't want to take it for granted. We don't want to dishonor you by learning something but not becoming different people empowered by the spirit. So guide us as we think together about this paragraph. We need your help in Christ's name. Amen. December 29th, 1972, Eastern Airlines Flight 401 took off from LaGuardia Airport, headed for Miami, Florida. And the first 80% of the flight was uneventful, no problem. But as they got over northern Florida, the pilot noticed that they had a problem with an indicator light on the dashboard. And the problem specifically was a light didn't come on that they needed to be on because it was a light that indicated the nose gear had successfully locked down. And so he's thinking, uh, our nose gear isn't locked. We could set this, on the pave, set this on the runway and the nose would just go right in. 
And so he and the co-pilot and the navigator, all three started working on this problem. They're reading their manual, they're talking to the mechanics, they're running diagnostics, and they're just extremely concerned about, uh, it's, it's not good to land with your nose gear not locked. And while they were working on this, very intensely focused on it, they didn't realize that they had turned off the autopilot. And this, air, this aircraft was steadily losing altitude. And it lost altitude so badly that it indeed flew straight into the Everglades. 101 people died, 75 viciously injured. And that happened, friends, not because of an indicator light, but because three people forgot job one. Job one for a pilot is fly the airplane. The investigation later showed that the light was just burned out. The gear was locked just fine. They had no problems. But they focused so intensely on a secondary thing, they forgot job one, which is fly the airplane. I told you that story to ask you this question. Do you think you are focused on job one as a Christian? Or is it possible that you are fussing with a dash light? Is it possible you're doing something that's good or important or even great, but you're not actually flying the airplane? And I think Paul is talking to us today about a very critical issue for us that we need to be careful we're not distracted from, that we're actually about our business, that we're doing our job, as opposed to fussing with other stuff that might be good, but is not critical and key. And so I said, as I said in verse 1, Paul says, for this reason, because the Jew and Gentile are one new man, he's going to tell us something. But by the power of the Spirit, he gets sidetracked. He comes back to it in verse 14. So next week, Pastor Steve will explain to you what he intended to say this week. In the meantime, he's going to do 13 verses that say, well, I got sidetracked a little bit. Uh, so verse 14, he'll get back to it. And in these 13 verses of, quote, sidetrack, uh, he begins to say to us, listen, here's what my ministry is. Here's what's my calling. He basically answers the question, what's up in my life? What did I do on summer vacation? It's, it's his essay. What did I do on summer vacation? Here it is. He's going to explain to us. He begins by saying to us, I am a prisoner of Christ Jesus. It's very important to understand he's not a prisoner of Rome. He's not in jail because of Rome. He's in jail because of Jesus. If he were not a follower of Jesus, he wouldn't be in jail. And if he would just deny Jesus, he could get out of jail. He's not willing to do that. Bless God. He's deeply committed to it. Hebrews 11 talks about Christians who were offered their release if they would deny Christ. And they wouldn't do it. There were some people who were literally given this ultimatum. You deny Christ or we're going to saw you in half. And they said, better get to saw him because I'm not denying Christ. He never died, denied me. I'm not denying him. And so Paul is in prison because he's a Christian, not because the Romans have somehow overpowered him. This is happening in A.D. 61. It's when he wrote the book of Ephesians. He's in jail in, in Rome. He's going to be killed in A.D. 66 by Nero, the emperor who absolutely hated Christians. And he was killed because he would not deny Christ. He had a huge commitment to the Savior. So he says, I'm a pri prisoner of Christ for the sake of the Gentiles. God said to him, take the gospel of the Gentiles. He said, I will. The Jews said, we're not happy about that. He said, I don't care. The Jews turned him over to the Romans. And he was a prisoner for the sake of the Gentiles. He was suffering for the sake of other people. And truthfully, friends, there are times we have to suffer for the sake of other people. There are many times we suffer for doing the right thing. Uh, sort of in my mind, if I do the wrong thing, yeah, I should suffer. But if I do the right thing, I should be blessed. Not necessarily. Paul was absolutely doing the right thing. But because of his calling and identity, he was suffering. Remember what Jesus said? If they treat me this way, how do you think they're going to treat you? <laughs> it's, we're in for it, friends. If we're going to be serious about following Christ, we're in for it. So here's his parentheses, verses 2 to 13. He interrupts himself by the Spirit and says, Number one, I was given a stewardship of God's mystery. Your text might say stewardship. It might use the word administration. But whichever word it uses, it means this. It is the careful 
and, and intentional, faithful management of the resources of another person that you do not own but have been entrusted to you. Paul says, I have a stewardship that was given to me, and I've got to be careful with what was given. We'll talk about what he received in a minute. But 1 Corinthians 4.2 it is required of a steward, moreover, that someone be found trustworthy, faithful. He doesn't, want to see, he doesn't say be found wealthy, be found skillful, be found rich, be found famous, be found ha any, handsome, anything. He just says be faithful. Just do what I've called you to do. That's the massive issue in the Christian faith. Am I about what God left me to do? When I was in Bible school, God gave me a job at the freight dock. I was loading freight at night. And my job was to load freight for Albuquerque. So one night I finished a truck for Albuquerque. I go back up to the foreman's desk and I'm waiting for my new assignment. And one of my coworkers walked up and said to the, the freight doc, uh, foreman, where's Mark O'Neill? And the foreman said, I don't know. And the guy walked off. And then as an afterthought, the foreman said, word for word, but wherever he is, he's working. Mark O'Neill was a guy who didn't have to be watched. He wasn't sneaking up in the front of the trailer, sitting behind a pallet for a 20-minute smoke break. He didn't have to be watched. Wherever he is, he's working, and I, I have never forgotten that. That was 40 years ago. That's the definition of faithfulness, wherever I am. I am faithfully about what God has given me to do. Verse 2, Paul says, I have this stewardship because of God's grace. Now, we usually think of grace as the unmerited favor of God, and it is. But it's also the unmerited ability of God to do what he told us to do. He never mocks us by telling us to do stuff we cannot do. I used to hold my kids on the ceiling of our trailer house when they were children, just like one and a half years old or two, and say, get down, get down, get down. And of course they're squirming, they can't get down. I'm mocking them. It's horrible parenting. <laughs> horrible. I've never been forgiven for it, and I shouldn't be. But God doesn't do that. God doesn't give us this list of 800 commands in the New Testament, and then we can't do them, and he's just entertaining himself watching us flounder. That's not the kind of a dad he is. If he said to do it, we can do it. He gives us unmerited ability. Verse 2, it's a gift. It's given. What did Paul do to get his stewardship and his identity and his gift and his revelation and his calling and his ministry? What did he do? He stuck out his sweaty little palm. That's it. 1 Corinthians 4, 2, 4, 7. What do you have that you've not received? Answer, nothing. It's all a gift. I mean, you may have been diligent. You may have gone to school. You may be a good networker. You may be educated. You may be a hardworking person. But end of the day, what you have, you've received as a gift. Everything I have in my life, I was just given as a gift. I stuck out my sweaty little palm. What was Paul given? Verse 3. He was given the revelation that by revelation was made known to me. A revelation is simply something that can only be known <clears throat> if someone tells it to you. Paul didn't know about Christ and what Christ had done. And the Father revealed it to him, same as he's done to us. It's, it's pivotal, it's foundational that someone say, here's what's true. There's a lot of things in life we can't know unless we're told. What if the gospel were all true and we didn't know? What if I have a sin problem and I did not know? And I'm separated from the God of the universe and I had no idea. And Jesus had paid for my sin, and I didn't know. And I could be saved through trusting Christ, but no one ever told me. I'm going to hell forever because I didn't know. I never placed my trust in Christ. I just didn't know. Revelation is so critical, and thank God he has given us revelation. Paul said, God gave me a revelation, and here it is, verse 3. He told me this mystery. What is a mystery? Something hidden that's been revealed. Something we didn't know, been revealed. In the Old Testament, they didn't know this. Here's the mystery, verse 6. The Gentiles are fellow heirs, fellow members of the body, fellow partakers of the promise in Christ, in Christ Jesus through the gospel. We have all the spiritual blessings when we trust Christ. We didn't know that. Now we know. We're, we're full family. We're not, we're not second-class citizens. We're full family with the Jews who have trusted Christ we are in. 
And God has always been a missionary God. Old Testament, New Testament. His heart was always for the nations. Read the book of Psalms sometime and look at every time you see the word, the nations. The nations will glorify me. The nations will bring, bring their sacrifice. The ethnos, the, the uh, uh, people groups. God so loved the world, not God so loved only the Jews. God so loved the world. The, Jew, the Jews or the Gentiles, if they trust Christ, they are in. And so Paul is saying to us in these first few verses that he was entrusted with a valuable piece of property. Here's the property he was entrusted with, verse 7. He was made a minister of the gospel. <clears throat> so minister uh, is the Greek word diakonos, which we get our word deacon. And it, it simply means one who serves, one who serves tables. It's like a waiter or a waitress. What do they do? You go to Bardenay this afternoon, they bring you your drink, they bring you your meal. If you get dessert, they bring you dessert. If you need another napkin, if you drop your fork, they serve you. They just bring it. And Paul said, I am a servant, and what did I bring? I brought the gospel message. I told you what is true about Jesus Christ because I was happy to serve you. I mean, Jesus himself said, Matthew 20, 28, I did not come to be served, but to serve and give my life a, a ransom for many. Jesus is a servant. Paul's a servant. We're servants. We're, we're table waiters. We're supposed to be bringing what, what people need. And Paul says, I did all this by the grace of God, the unmerited favor and ability of God. He just, for some reason, decided to choose me and to do that. Now, friends, my favorite devotional book of all time is called Trust for Today. It's written for, by a group of men out of Phoenix by, uh, called uh, True Face Ministries. It's a stinking brilliant book. I love it. Trust for today. Here's their definition of grace. It comes from May, May 27th. Grace is the absolute and unforced favor gained by Christ's death and resurrection, allowing God to be completely for us and endlessly in love with us apart from anything we must prove. Grace is an actual reality, a way of life in which we no longer strive for acceptance. We mature, heal, and are released into his intentions by trusting that all the power of Jesus is fused in us, creating an entirely new person. Because of grace, I am an entirely new person. An actual reality, not an ethereal out there, some sort of um, you know, unnamed nebulous force. I'm a new person by the power of the Spirit living in me. And Paul says, that's why I was given this ability to help people is because of the grace of God. Grace does not motivate us to live any way we want. It motivates us to, to please God. Personally, I've never known a Christian who said, okay, I've got fire insurance, so I'm going to live like crazy. I've never known one. It's never motivated me that way. It's always motivated me to say, I'm so grateful for what he did that I'm going to live for him. This was all done, verse 7, in accordance with the working of God's power. He's the one who gives us the ability to do what we need to do. Next week, Pastor Steve will talk about chapter 3, 20 and 21, one of the most stunning phrases about the power of God that actually works in us. I am not left to my own abilities. God's power works in us. So Paul says, I'm a manager, I'm a steward, I'm bringing you the gospel. It was all given to me by revelation. Verses 8 to 12, number 3. He was given grace, here we are again, for this work in order to preach the gospel. God gave him unmerited ability to say what's true about Jesus and what he had done and the gift that God is offering to us. Gave me grace, he says, to preach the gospel. And in that, Paul gives a very interesting description of himself. He says to us in verse 8, I am the least of all the saints. I don't know, friends. <laughs> I think he's above me. But the Holy Spirit <clears throat> motivated him to write in the book forever, I am the least of all the saints. Uh, he said to us furthermore in 1 Timothy 1.15, I am the chief of sinners. I am the worst sinner who ever lived. I don't know. Must have been a photo finish <laughs> because, I mean, I was right there. I'm the least of all the apostles, 1 Corinthians 15.9. I mean, you, you hear these three things, and you think, uh, either this man has a horrible self-image or it's false humility. What's going on here? But
But it's all inspired by the Holy Spirit. Apparently, because he killed Christians and opposed Christ, he could accurately put himself in these categories. And if God was willing to do this for the least of all, all the Christians, for the least of all the apostles, for the greatest of the sinners, maybe he's willing to do it for us. Give us grace to pull us into service the way he did for Paul. So despite all of this, he was given the ability to preach the gospel. It doesn't only mean stand on the platform and speak from the Bible. It means herald, proclaim, say words, reveal truth. The ability to say what people need to hear it means simply to open my mouth and give people the life-saving news about Jesus Christ. The gospel is words. <clears throat> there is a very unbiblical, very horrible, very popular Christian phrase that goes like this. Preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. I absolutely hate that saying. Uh, it was attributed to Francis Assisi. I certainly hope he didn't say it. Because, friends, the gospel is words. Now, 1 Peter 2 says, I need to live in such a way that I, dis I, 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 I help people want to trust Christ. Uh, I need to live in a way that predisposes them to respond to the gospel message. Certainly, I want to live that way. But I can't give the gospel unless I use words, because the gospel is words. For example, 1 Corinthians 5, 15. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. The only place in the New Testament where the gospel is specifically defined, Paul said, I deliver to you as of first importance that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, that on the third day he was raised according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by more than 500 brethren at one time. That's words. Romans 10, 14. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. The gospel is words. In order to communicate, I've got to form words. I've got to speak, type, text, write. Somehow I've got to make words if I'm going to be a person who is actually giving the gospel to others. So Paul says, listen, here's what I'm giving. Verse 8. I'm giving the unfathomable riches of Christ. I'm telling people there's riches in Christ that cannot be measured. A fathom is, is the measure of an average man's fingertips, fingertip to fingertip. It's six feet long. And in ancient time, the, the mariners would have a, a drum with a big line wrapped around it, and on that line, every six feet was a mark. And at the end of that line was a heavy weight. And so they would feed it over the edge, and the weight would take it to the bottom. And if it stopped at four fathoms, you were in 24 foot of water. If it stopped at 100 fathoms, 600 feet of water. Well, what Paul is saying to us is, when you're feeding the line over into the riches of Christ, it doesn't stop. You know, you get to 100 fathoms, 200 fathoms, 500 fathoms, then, then the rope breaks off the drum, and it's still sinking. It's just gone. That's how deep the riches of Christ are. You can't plumb the depths of them. Now, friends, um, lists, lists are an absolute no-no in homiletics. Absolute no-no, and I cannot resist. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you a little list. It's 43 items long. I'll spare you all 43. But here is some of the riches of Christ that we have. One, forgiveness of sins. Three, United with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Six, reconciled to God. Eight, made complete in Christ. Nine, justified by God. Ten, free from the law. Eleven, redeemed. Seventeen, members of a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a chosen generation, a special people of God. Eighteen, given a spiritual inheritance. Twenty, heavenly citizens. Twenty-three, new life. Twenty-four, eternal life. Twenty-five, abundant life. Twenty-six, indwelling by the Holy Spirit. 27, sealed forever by the Holy Spirit. 28, enabled and motivated by the Holy Spirit. 32, a new nature. 33, hope. 42, anticipating eternal joy with God where we'll spend forever without sin, conflict, tears, pain, injury, illness, or alienation. We'll spend forever doing the three things, giving praise to God, having great fellowship with each other, and serving others and God by doing meaningful things that we're really good at and that we love doing. That's part of the riches of Christ. 43, Ephesians 1, 3. He's blessed us 
in the Lord Jesus Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in, in Christ. The unfathomable riches of God. You can't measure how deep it is. And he says to us, he was enlightening people with his words about this, verse 11. It all happened, as we said last week, because of the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. It all happened because of what Jesus did. If he hadn't done this, we are of all people most to be pitied. Because of this, he says, verse 12, we also have access to the Heavenly Father. Veil is ripped. We walk right into the presence of God. We don't grovel. We don't crawl in. We don't sneak in. We, in Christ, we just walk in to the presence of the Holy God of the universe, presence of our Father. He allows us to be in his presence. Hebrews 14, Hebrews 4, 16, he says to us, we, with confidence we enter the throne room of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Friends, remember the story of Esther? She's told to go into the king to try and save the Jews, and she says to her uncle, if I go in and he doesn't extend the scepter to me, I'll be killed. And her uncle says, you're born for the kingdom for a time such as this. You have to go in. And so she walked in, and in the kindness of God, he extended the scepter, and she wasn't killed. This passage says God has eternally, permanently extended the scepter to us. We walk straight into the throne room because we're covered with the blood of Christ. We don't sneak in. We don't grovel. We don't, we don't, we don't go in there in, in fear thinking, I'm going to lose my life. So he closes this, verse 13, by saying, because of all this that's going on here, because I'm a manager, a servant, because I'm preaching the gospel, because I'm suffering for your sake, Ephesians, do not lose heart. Take courage. Paul's basic message is, I'm choosing to do this for you. I'm happy to do this for you. I'm not chafing under this. I'm not upset about this. He's serving them for their, for their good, and he's very happy about it. How many times have you served someone that's caused you to suffer and you said, hey, I'm glad to do it. I'm glad to do it. How many of you would give up a kidney for your child or your grandchild? A second kidney. <laughs> I'm not a medical person, friends. I don't think you do too well without kidneys. But there's a piece of me that thinks, hey, if I had one grandson who was going to die or live 75 years if he had my kidney, I would do it. And if I had another grandson who had the same issue, I think I would do it. I mean, you suffer to serve other people. How many of you would give your car to your granddaughter so she doesn't have to drop out of college? How many of you would give, give, give your weekend to help a friend? I have a friend who grew up in a very impoverished situation because her father abandoned her mother, her, and the two younger brothers. And she said to us one time, that every day of her school life, she would leave the house where her mother had packed a meager lunch for her, a meager lunch for her brother, and a meager lunch for her brother. And they would get out of sight of their mom and she would give half of her meager lunch to her younger brother and half of her meager lunch to her other brother. She never ate lunch her whole school years. She suffered for her brother's sake and she was happy to do it. Paul says, I'm suffering for your sake, but Please don't worry about it. Be, be encouraged. I'm, I'm doing this with joy. I'm very happy to do this. That's a thumbnail sketch of what Paul was up to in his life. Now, I want to suggest that the core idea here of this whole passage is this. Like Paul, we are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We know the message. We know the words. It's been re revealed to us. We understand the truth. Like Paul, we're ambassadors. We have the same gospel, same stewardship, same ministry, same grace. He's more famous than us, but we have the same everything. And the question is, am I fussing with the light on the dashboard? Am I about job one, or am I fussing with a light that is on the dashboard? Stewardship of the gospel is critical. So friends, <clears throat> I, I, I think two applications. Number one, Ephesians take courage, Idahoans take courage. God is wringing his hands in heaven about nothing. Don't be anxious. Number two, am I a person who is really about 
being an ambassador for Christ? Am I sharing the gospel? Am I saying words, opening my mouth? Now, friends, I, I, I'm very old, but I can remember very clearly thinking to myself, I will never learn to tie my shoes. I had a horrible fight with it. That's how bright I am. Couldn't learn to tie my shoes. I can never learn this, but I did. And now I do it unconsciously. I sit down and tie them. I don't even think about it. I will never learn to read, but I did, and I do it unconsciously. I will never learn to spell, but I did, and I do it unconsciously. I will never learn to swim, but I did. I do it unconsciously. I will never learn to type, but I did, and I do it unconsciously. I will never learn to drive, but I did, and I do it unconsciously. I will never learn to share Christ. I got it. I got it. Thank you. <laughs> My dad's an unconscious driver. Thank you. I'll change that third hour. I'll never learn to share Christ, but I do. I do it unconsciously, friends. It's not a fight for me anymore. Now, it shouldn't be. I'm 51 years into this. I wish I had it earlier. But I do share Christ. I open my mouth. I say the words. And it, it's not a point of sadness, anxiety, and fear. It's a point of incredible joy. I have been sitting on a front row seat when someone came from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. When you have a front row seat to that, friends, it's like Turkish delight in Narnia. It's like, I'll do whatever to get some more of that. It's glorious. So uh, I want to close today by, by giving, you, uh, giving you an outline of the five things to do to be a great evangelist. If I'd had this paper the second day I trusted Christ, it would have changed everything for me. I'm not saying that because it's my paper. I'm saying it's because of stuff I picked up over the course of 50 years. This paper is available to you on the back welcome table as you go out. Please grab one. Uh, here's the five things I think that if a person will do, they'll be an incredible evangelist. They are not difficult things. Sharing Christ is utterly doable. Utterly doable. Number one, pray for gospel opportunities. God answers prayer, and he especially answers prayer when we're praying for something that he wants to happen. He wants the gospel given to people. Pray for gospel opportunities. Number two, learn the gospel cold. Know exactly what to say. You have a sin problem, it separates you from the holy God. Jesus died as your substitute in your place. You can be saved by putting your trust in Jesus Christ. Is there anything keeping you from trusting Christ right now? That's it. Sin, separation, substitution, trust. What's keeping you from trusting Christ right now? First time I had a chance to share the gospel, I was a pretty new Christian. A friend point blank asked me. I spoke for 20 minutes. When I got done, he was more confused, or I was more confused. It was a, it was a mess, <laughs> utter mess. At that time in my Christian faith, I didn't know. Sin, separation, substitution, trust. Learn the gospel cold. Number three, learn three simple questions for transitioning from secular conversation to gospel conversation. In my experience, this is the hardest thing. How do you go from sports, politics, camping, fishing, how do you go from that to the gospel? Here's three suggestions. Number one, say to the person, if you could ask God any question or take him to task on any item, what would it be? And then typically they say, well, what about sin, suffering, and evil, or some other question? It doesn't really matter what question they ask because you're in a gospel conversation. You're in a spiritual conversation. And it's a very natural transition. Number two, say to the person, is there anything I can pray for you about? And typically what they say, I've done this many times, typically what they say, usually with eyes teared up, is my mother's dying, uh, my child is sick, I lost my job, uh, my father's mad at me, whatever it is, and then pray for it right there. And follow that up with this question. Would you say you're near to God or far, far from God? And if they say, I'm far from God, give them the gospel. If they say, I'm near to God, give them the gospel. <laughs> People thinking they're near to God and actually being near to God is not necessarily the same thing. If they say to me, I'm far from God, I just give the gospel. If they say I'm near to God, I say to them, let me tell you how I came near to God. 
sin, separation, substitution, trust. Give them the gospel. Number three, if you stood before God right now and he said to you, why should I forgive your sin and let you live in my heaven? What would you say to him? You're into a gospel conversation. They're going to give you one of three answers. A works answer, I believe in God plus works answer, or Jesus alone. If they give you a works answer, it means the cross was unnecessary. If they give you a God plus works answer, it means the cross was insufficient. If they give you Jesus alone, it means the cross was necessary and sufficient, and they put their hope in Christ. Give them the gospel. Number four, be a servant-hearted, gracious, truthful friend, and when they come to a crossroads of trouble, they will think about you. They will think about you because they know you're compassionate and you have spiritual resources. I've had many times in my life, friends, where people have come to me at their spiritual crossroads. I, I, I had two, two people in Idaho Falls, 75 years old, non-practicing Mormons. Their son got killed in a car wreck at 45. Wonderful Christian man. I never knew him. He's a veterinarian, lived in Boise. 1,100 people came to his funeral. Wonderfully loved guy. And this couple came into my office after their boy died. They're 75, haven't darkened the door of a church for 65 years. And they came in my office and wanted to talk about faith. And they both came to faith, sitting in my office, because I'd been a friend of theirs, I was a neighbor of theirs, they knew I was compassionate, and they knew I had spiritual resources. Be a great friend to people. Number five, open your mouth when God opens the door. Open your mouth when God opens the door. It's not that scary. Sharing Christ is utterly doable. If I'd had these five things, friends, the second day I knew Christ, would have made a huge difference for me. <clears throat> I'll close with this question. If you were God, and you had a spiritual seeker wandering around the Boise Valley, would you put that person next to a person who was doing these five things, or would you put that seeker next to a person who was fussing with a light on the dashboard? I think God assigns airplane seats. I think God, if he gets a seeker, he puts him next to a person who's up to these five things. Let me pray for us, friends. We're grateful to you, Father, for your ridiculous goodness to us. Thank you that someone opened their mouth and said the words to us. I pray we'd be people who open our mouths and say the words to others. We need your guidance. We need your help. We pray in Christ's name. Friends, as you leave today, please grab a handout on the welcome table. Stand up and close with us, please.